Hey, take out your message notes inside your worship folder. We're going to wrap up the series today called Recession Lessons, and a message that I'm very excited about because I think it's the most important recession lesson of all, all that we've been through. Today we're going to learn, I think, this is just Wes's opinion, the most important lesson. It has been in my life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, okay? Lord, you are indeed amazing, and you forever are our God, and we seek right now to hear from you. Lord, we're aware that all around us are people that don't know of your grace and don't know of your love, and we ask that you would put them in our path and in our mind and in our heart, give us the courage that we need to timidly maybe, or with great fear even, hand them this invitation and invite them so that they can know your amazing love. And now, Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher. In this moment, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody agreeing said, amen. Well, when I was growing up, my family celebrated Thanksgiving weekend at a little cabin that we had on the, um, nearby the Kentucky River in northern Kentucky. And it was a great place to go during holidays, a great t- place to go as we would gather there with all my cousins and, and uh, we would go explore the river banks and we would go uh, swimming if, if it was warm enough. It usually wasn't, but um, we would go boating. We'd go out in a little john boat, go fishing. We had a great time going, going all around. Here's when it was not fun. It was whenever it rained and was cold and dark, and that happened a lot in the Ohio Valley. And so many times we found ourselves on Thanksgiving weekend stuck inside of a cabin because it was so miserable outside. And this cabin had no phone. It had no television. And this is going to hurt some of you. But there was actually no internet there. Yeah, I know. And you're like, how did he live? Oh, man, how did he make it? Well, what my parents decided to do one day, and we only did this once, is they brought out a jigsaw puzzle, one of these like 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzles. I guess we had complained so much that they were annoyed, and they wanted to keep us all quiet, and so they brought out this jigsaw puzzle, and we started working this jigsaw puzzle together, and it was that day that I learned I don't like jigsaw puzzles, and here's... (laughs) Here's why. So if I'm on your your shopping list for Christmas, and I hope I am, (laughs) don't get me a jigsaw puzzle. I don't like jigsaw puzzles. If you you have to get me one, get me one with like five pieces, you know, the ones that in our our nursery, I can do those pretty well. But uh, we were all there together, and we spread it all around, and we're, we're working on this thing, and we get done finally. I mean, like it was a year later. I think it was the next Thanksgiving we finished this thing. And we realized that this used jigsaw puzzle that we bought at a yard sale somewhere and put in the closet was missing a bunch of pieces. Oh, man, exactly. So don't give me a jigsaw puzzle. I don't like them. I don't like jigsaw puzzles. But people, here's what they say. They say, life is a lot like a jigsaw puzzle. Now, this sends a shudder up my spine every time I hear that. But they'll say things like this. Life is like a jigsaw puzzle. You've got to see the big picture, you know, like on the box top and all that. Or people say, life is like a jigsaw puzzle. Establish your borders and boundaries early. That's a tip that I understand. Here's my advice. Life is like a jigsaw puzzle. Don't work it unless you have all the pieces. (laughs) Because if you end up with more puzzle than pieces, then you end up with a very bad day, right? That's no, no fun to do that. And yet, in the game of life, the puzzle of life, that's what many of us try to do, isn't it? We try to work life out without all of the pieces. And we find many of us at the end, as we look back, that the, we've got more puzzle than we do pieces to fill in the holes. And we're left with these, these holes, and there's a piece of us that feels incomplete, unfulfilled, unfinished, and frustrated when it comes to life. I mean, after all, we've worked hour after hour or day after day or decade after decade trying to figure out what exactly is this life that God has a place for me to live. And we try to put it all together. And then we turn around and we realize that there's some holes in it. There's holes. And it just leaves us frustrated because we start the search for the missing piece. You know what I'm talking about here? N.T. Wright says that every one of us has a voice that we hear. It's the echo of a voice saying there's more to life than this. Ever heard that voice before? You've been thinking about it. You've had some time off maybe this week. Maybe you're, you're wanting to know what is it in my soul that could complete the picture 
What is the, the one thing that I want to spend my life doing that will, that will finally place my soul at rest and at peace? The thing that will finally make me complete and whole. Now, what we've learned over these last few weeks throughout our study of God's Word is that one of the familiar places we go to fill in the holes in our life is to money and the stuff money buys. And we've learned that that is a silly pursuit to fill in our holes in our life because we learned that God owns everything. And we also learned that more doesn't make us happy. And let's just admit, we've seen that over the last few days. I mean, did you think another scoop of stuffing or another slice of pie was going to make you happy? It made me a little bit more happy until I realized I got a little bit bigger love handles now than when I started this week. Or how about Black Friday shopping? Anybody attempt this? Raise your hand. Come on, admit it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Few, yeah. Wow, I'm surprised that like, it seemed like the entire world was out. One guy camped out at Best Buy for eight days here in Fort Myers. It's, it's amazing. Well, more doesn't make us happy. Here's what happens on, on many of these, these shopping seasons that we're going to enter into, that we've already started entering into. Isn't it true that for many of us, we spend money that we don't have to buy things that we don't need to impress people we don't like? <laughs> I mean, isn't that just the honest truth about it all? And the Bible says that it's just foolish to think that stuff's going to fill the missing piece, that's going to fill out the puzzle. It's just foolish to think that. But here's the good news. Pastor George came back from India last week, and I don't know if you could tell, the guy was, he was on fire. He was exhausted, jet-lagged, and passionate because he had this perspective-altering trip where he saw the joy of the Lord present with people, and he came back with this good news after seeing the miracles that God can do once again with his own eyes. He came back to tell us the good news that recovery is possible. Recovery is possible for all of us that have been taken down and taken apart and left in pieces through this recession, that recovery is possible because Jesus saves us. We know that. That's good news. But did you know Jesus wants to save your wallet too? Jesus want, doesn't want to just save your body. He wants to save your bank account. And recovery is possible. And we've got almost 40 people signed up for the Financial Peace University course that's going to start in January. We need at least 100 people signed up for this. This is good stuff. Recovery is possible. Financial recovery is possible. I encourage you to check the Let's Connect card box on the back. It says, I want to sign up for that Financial Peace University. We'll work on the time and try to make it good for you. Offer a couple different times so that you can be a part of understanding that God can be your chief financial officer, and it makes all the difference. Well, today we're going to wrap up this series with what I believe is the most important and ultimate recession lesson, and I'll share it with you in a few minutes, I promise. But let me say that this recession lesson has been called the highest of all virtues. It's been called the essential word for prayer. It has been called the highest form of faith, what we're going to talk about and discover today. And lots of us have been searching our lives for this, haven't we? And what I pray is that God will reveal to you through the scripture that we're going to study, he's going to reveal to you the missing piece. Now, before we get into all that, let's consider the puzzle of life itself for just a moment, shall we? Let's think about the, the box top, the big picture idea. Let's think about that. When all the pieces come together, what does God delight in seeing? What does God design for us? Or as Jesus said, it's my life verse, John 10, 10, that he came to give us life to the fullest. What is that? How can we describe it? Well, when all the pieces come together, Paul writes to his friends in a city called Thessalonica. Everybody say Thess Thessalonica. <laughs> Thessalonica, exactly. It sounds like Daffy Duck. So in Thessalonica, Paul writes to his friends, and here's what he says. I digress. Let's go back to the scripture, shall we? Richard, help me out. Put it up. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Yes, let's go to the, the word of the Lord. Here, here's the ultimate box top picture. I had to make sure you're awake there before we get into it. Here we go. Let's read it out loud together. May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ, the one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. 
Now, this is what's called a benediction. Now, you've heard that word before. Now, we shall have the benediction. All rise for the benediction. What's a benediction? Well, let me break it down for you. Uh, two words make up the word benediction. Bene, which means good, and diction, which means words. And so what is a benediction? Good words. That's it. Good words. And you thought it was something, you know, some real amazing uh, deal out there. It's just good words. But how good are these words? <laughs> How good are these words that, that God is the one who makes everything and everyone holy and whole? You've been ever trying to put your life together all by yourself? It doesn't work, does it? And so today, the good news is you can bring your wandering spirit, your wounded soul, and your broken body to God. And at last, you can find rest. Why? Because our master, Jesus Christ, on the screen, it says the one who called you, he's calling you, and he's completely dependable. If he said it, what's it say? He'll do it. If he said it, what's it say? Come on now, we got to wake up, church. This is good stuff. This is the box top I'm talking about. All right, we are talking about life itself, life to the fullest. I, I sat around as a kid listening to some, some older youth at a campfire singing at a church camp, and they were singing a song that went like this, something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. And all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but God made something beautiful of my life. Now, I want that, don't you? I remember those kids singing that because I thought, that sounds good. I want that. And the good news is you can bring your confusion, your brokenness and strife, and God can make something beautiful in your life out of your life. He can turn your mess into a masterpiece. He can turn your mess into a message. And my longing today, my prayer for you today, the reason I got out of bed today, and the first thing I was thinking about today was the Lord and then you. What I was thinking about is I don't want you to just, just believe in Jesus. I want you to know him. I don't want you to just, just, um, just think about this is good stuff. This is, a, this is a good kind of thesis. That's nice to know. No, I want you to experience this for yourself. I want you to know how God can fill the holes in your heart and in your soul. How? How? Well, that's the question of the day. How can my life be whole? This is what the teaching team thought was an essential question for us to wrestle with because to be whole, to be complete, is to be undivided and full. How do we find it? Well, right before Paul gives this benediction, he gives three simple yet profound instructions on how to live this kind of whole life. Anybody ready for that life? You want to live that kind of whole life? I do. I do. So let's learn. Let's look at them together. Number one, learn to rejoice no matter what. We need to learn to rejoice no matter what. Now, I think there's a longing in every one of our hearts to rejoice. And here's, here's how I know this. We love parties, don't we? We love parties. We have parties all the time. We, we just think of reasons to have parties, and a lot of times they're, they're great reasons. I mean, we have birthday parties, housewarming parties, cocktail parties, derby parties, Super Bowl parties, Fourth of July parties, Cinco de Mayo parties, New Year's Day parties, Christmas parties, St. Patrick's Day parties, wedding party, graduation parties. We love to party. <laughs> Sometimes, though, we can't think of a reason, so we party around mundane things. Anybody ever been at the office and been thinking, you know what, we should have, we should have a office party. Yeah, an office party. That'd be cool. We should have a party tonight. Well, what should we have? Well, I don't know. I was planning on having dinner. <gasps> Let's have a dinner party. That's what we should do, a dinner party. So sometimes when we open our cabinets, we're like, I know what I need. I need more Tupperware. We should have a Tupperware party. That's right. Sometimes we think, you know what, we need to have a party. Whoa, let's get dressed up. And go to, I don't have anything to wear to the party. You know what, what, what should we wear? Well, in college, we would go, well, I got, I got a bed sheet. Let's, let's have a toga party. That's right. We can have a, a toga party. I mean, we think of all of these reasons to have parties. And we, you know, and we, there's a lot of swimming pools around here, but, but we have like pool parties. Why are we having a party? Because we have a pool. Wow. You have a pool. That's amazing. And if you don't get invited to the party, here's what you can do you can crash the party, right? Now, sometimes if you're really elite, really lucky, you'll get invited to the after party. So what do we do after a party? We have a party, right? We, we love to party. That's, that's it. There's a longing in our heart to rejoice. We want to rejoice. And the reason I love following Jesus is that 
God calls us to this life of rejoicing. It's a party. It's a party. And I know some of you think, oh, no, no, no. He's just the great killjoy. That's all God is. No, you haven't read the Bible. No, you haven't followed Jesus. You've not felt the power, the energy, the joy, the ecstasy of following Jesus in your life. There's nothing better. There's nothing greater. Tony Campola wrote a book called The Kingdom of God is a Party. And he's right. All throughout this, this book, there's party after party, rejoicing after rejoicing. Jesus summarized all of his teaching, and he said this. He said, I've told you all these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy, and that your joy might be wholly mature. You know what Jesus is saying? I'm teaching you all this so you'll know how to grow up and party. That's why I'm teaching you all this stuff. You'll know what it's like to live your life with that kind of joy, that kind of gladness. Paul knew this. That's why in his letters, two dozen times, he mentions rejoicing. Look with me at what he says. This is that first instruction on a whole life. Verse 16, read it with me. Rejoice always. Now, you might want to memorize that. You say, I don't know if I can. I believe you can do it. Let's say it again. Rejoice always. When do we rejoice? I thought that's what you said. Rejoice always, no matter what. You see, that is what the difference is in people that follow Jesus and people who do not. Because we can have this spirit-enabled ability to rejoice no matter what. No matter what. Because let's face it, all of our parties, they come to an end, don't they? They come to an end. This week I read that the Guinness Book of World Records' longest dance party came to an end. It was only 55 hours. 55 hours. And it came to an end. Eventually all the parties, they come to an end. All the guests go home, the food runs out, everybody gets tired of everybody, and so the party ends. But what I'm talking about is ability to rejoice when? Some of you are waking up. I love it. Now, rejoice when? Exactly. Even when things are going south. I had a friend named Jeff. still have a friend named Jeff who helped me plant a church in Kentucky. He was an award-winning photographer, and his pictures will greet you if you get off of a plane in Lexington or Louisville airports. The, the whole place is filled with his, his art and his pictures. And I had the honor of walking with him and his precious wife, Sally, as she battled cancer and eventually went to be with the Lord. A young woman, her and Jeff, deeply in love. And Jeff, beyond being this great photographer, was a great man of faith and is a great follower of Jesus, just somebody I admire. And one day, when things were going really rough, he sent me this message He said, Sally has developed a fever. She's admitted to the hospital. They put in another stent to drain for drainage in her liver and tests were run, and she's got serious bacteria in her blood. And then he said this to me. He said, during this frightful time, I came upon this scripture from Habakkuk 3 that had brought me hope and comfort years ago. And here's what he wrote. Though the fig tree does not bud, though there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. And then Jeff said, thanks for your continued prayers and support. As we quote, go on the heights. And then he said, we still have great joy and peace. Take care, Jeff. I thought, this guy gets it. Rejoice in the Lord always. And at the bottom of all of Jeff's artwork, on his website, on his his business card, is his slogan. He has this line. He says, there is a landscape greater than the one we see. You have that vision? There's a landscape greater than what we can see with our human eyes. And so, no matter what, we can rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. We can be given that perspective. It's a gift from the God of love. Look with me at number two. We need to learn to pray at all times. Rejoice always and learn to pray at all times. When I was traveling about 10 or 12 years ago, I went through the Atlanta airport because that seems to be like a law that if you want to travel anywhere and you want to fly, you have to go through the Atlanta airport. So I was obedient as a citizen, so I went through the Atlanta airport. And a, a man came up to me as we were changing concourses, and this guy walks up to me, and he's, he never makes eye contact, but all of a sudden he starts talking to me about taking care of a business deal that needed to happen. 
a financial transaction. And he just went on and on about the details of it and exactly what needs to happen. He was like, I need it to happen today. Don't mess this up. I'm not telling you again. And I'm just like, I don't even know who you are. I mean, this is weird. And I'm starting to talk to him and he just looked at me very strange and he kept on instructing me on what to do. And then I finally just kind of, you know, dodged him. I got away from him in the crowd. And then I went down to that, that shuttle that's underneath all of the, the world or something down there uh, in the airport. And I'm driving, I'm sitting there and this guy comes up and he starts, and he sits down and he's next to me and he starts giving me orders about his kids. Like, I need you to, uh, to, to make sure they do their homework and you need to take them to the doctor and to make, them, to make sure that they clean their room. I mean, they're just, they're just getting by with too much and he's going on and on. And I finally said, sir, I don't, I don't even know you. I don't know what you're talking about. This is really weird. And he looked at me really weird. And the guy next to us is laughing his head off. And he points to his ear. He said, look at his ear. And I looked and there's this Star Trek thing coming down. <laughs> And he said, that's called Bluetooth. He said, that's called wireless. He can talk on the phone. I'm like, oh, he's not talking to me, is he? <laughs> I learned a lot about technology that day. But this guy was talking constantly. Hey, we're constantly connected to each other, aren't we? I mean, just, just go anywhere and look around at the amount of people that are with a bunch of people, but they're wanting to be with somebody else. They're on their phone. It's, it's odd, isn't it? Why don't we go be with that person? I don't, know, I don't get that. But we, we're in constant communication with each other, with, with, with Twitter, with Facebook, with our, with our phones, with, with email, all of this stuff. We're in constant communication. Here's what the Bible tells us that we need to do. We need to be in constant communication with God. We need to learn to pray at all times. Here's how verse 17 puts it. Ready? Read it with me. Pray continually. Pray when? Continually. That's right. 80% of Americans say that they pray. And I, I'll be the first to admit that I don't understand the mystery of prayer. But 80% of Americans say that they pray regularly. 50% say every day. 20% of atheists say that they pray regularly. Go figure that one out. I don't understand it. But anyway, here's my question about prayer. Are you praying just like to give a nod to God? Or are you wanting to draw close to Him? In fact, He wants to draw close to you. Prayer is not an art to be mastered. It's a relationship to be enjoyed and established. And you'll discover that God has been with you all along and that God wants you to know of his love and grace. So, so pray continually. God wants to come to you. And many of us have struggled through this recession because we thought we had to go through it all alone. God's been right by our side, longing to talk to us. So we can pray continually and we can be real and honest in our constant communication and listening to God. Look with me at number three. To find that wholeness, I must learn to give thanks no matter what happens. So number three, I must learn to give thanks no matter what happens. There's one more instruction that Paul gives on this life of being made whole. He says in verse 18, this hallmark verse, let's read it out loud together. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, give thanks for all circumstances? Is that what it says? You know, in, in. I am thankful for that, aren't you? Give thanks in all circumstances. See, an attitude of gratitude, it's good for the body, mind, and soul. And so Paul says, give thanks no matter what. Give thanks. When my son was about uh, four or five years old, we gathered on a weekend like this and we went out to a fancy restaurant with all of our family. And the extended family, the whole group was there. This was one of those very quiet restaurants with all the nice stuff and the little music playing in the background. A terrible place to take a five-year-old. That's what I was thinking. But we went there and we're gathered around uh, the table and the, the food comes and my son knows that that's kind of the cue to have the blessing. And so we all joined hand. We expected my dad, he was planning on saying the prayer for the whole big group of us in this nice, quiet restaurant. And all of a sudden, as every head was bowed and it was very quiet, my son goes, Oh, the Lord's been good to me. And so I thank the Lord for giving me the things I need, the sun and the rain and the apple seed. The Lord's been good to me. <laughs> And everybody's looking, you know. 
And we're all looking at each other, and you know, my dad goes, well, amen. <laughs> you know. But you know what? He's right. Whether you know it or not, the Lord has been good to you. Whether you know it or not, I mean, you're alive today. You got breath in your lungs. You got blood in your veins. You're alive today. The Lord has been good to you. Whether you know it or not, there's not been a a season of sorrow or a time of trouble or a tear that you've ever shed that Jesus was not there right by your side, longing for you to just rest in his arms of grace. There's never been a moment that he's not left you. He's been there longing for you to know that the Lord's been good. The Lord is good. The Lord's been good to you. The Lord has been good to me. Thanks be to God for his grace in Jesus Christ. And that's how Paul wraps up his letter. Look with me. At 1 Thessalonians 5, 28, this is his final word to his friends. Read it out loud with me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I want to invite the band to come and make their way up. And as they are coming, let me just tell you, this has been my prayer for you today. See, how in the world are we supposed to rejoice? How do we pray continually? How do we give thanks no matter what's going on in our life? I'll tell you how through the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May he be with us. That gives us the power. You see, 10 days ago, I discovered this anew. My wife, Becky, we went in for what we thought was a routine test for her. And they told us that we needed to go to Tampa immediately for her to have surgery three hours later. So we jumped in the car and we drove to Tampa and there the doctor said I think I can take care of that the surgeon came in said I think I think we can take care of everything we've caught it just in time and so he said I'll be back in about 45 minutes you go to this waiting room and I went to the waiting room and there I sat and it was late in the day and so I, I sat alone there's nobody else in there except that I wasn't alone I wasn't alone I didn't feel alone And as the 45 minutes turned into an hour, and then that hour turned into two, and then that hour turned into three, and then four, and no doctor came. I sat there and I had that moment. You know that moment where you stand at a crossroads between panic and peace. And I'm here to testify that the Lord Jesus Christ, he was with me. And he gave me peace peace. See, this is not my first trip to a waiting room. I can tell you that our God is true and he can be trusted. Jesus' grace, as Jen was saying, it's enough. It's enough. It was enough when I was in the waiting room and I was the patient waiting for heart surgery. It was enough when I was there with my dad right before he passed away. I know it's enough because Jesus was with me in the waiting room before we held our son Daniel as he died at birth. I'm telling you that Jesus has proven himself faithful and faithful over and over again. And in that moment at that crossroads of panic or peace, the presence, the peace of the Lord came upon me. And I want to tell you now the greatest recession lesson. Are you ready for it? It's gratitude. It is thanks. It's the Lord has been good to me. And so I thank the Lord for giving me the things that I need, the sun and the rain and the apple seed. Church, if we've not learned anything, can we learn that his grace is enough for us today? That it's not about stuff. It's not about stuff we used to own or stuff we hope to own. It's about the grace that has been given to us as a gift through Jesus Christ. It is amazing grace. It's for you today. He's completely dependable. Jesus puts us all together. He holds us all together. He's here for you. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we come to you with grateful hearts and yet we admit that we need more of your peace and grace Lord we we long to be able to do what we've just talked about we we want to rejoice 
We want to talk to you all the time and listen to you all the time. Know that you walk with us all along the way. We, we want to, to give you thanks, but we need your help. So be with us now as we worship you in song. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you don't know this amazing grace, I'll meet you over here. And we'll pray together. Come as the Lord leads you. If you need somebody to pray with you, lift a hand. The altar's open for you.